Well, saints, let's turn together to Philippians chapter 2. Continuing in Philippians 2 this morning. And along with last Lord's Day, we're continuing to focus on Philippians 2, verses 12 to 13 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. Saints, the word of the living God declares to us, Therefore, my beloved... As you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. May our God, who does so, bless the reading of his word this morning. Our God and creator, may you now bless the preaching of your word as well. May you bless it to the hallowing of your name in our hearts, for the joy of your people in you, in Christ Jesus. Spirit of God, would you glorify Christ in our hearts and minds this morning. Uh, along with my brother's prayer, may your sheep be fed. May I be, a, uh, may, may I be one who is simply being a, a mouthpiece for your word. May I be fed a, a, along with your sheep as, as one as well, simply serving under the good shepherd. May, may our hearts be knit together more in love. May we feel the weight of this text and other texts that will be brought in to see what we are looking at this morning and that we are to serve you and we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We are to function in the fear of you, our great and wondrous God. May we feel the weight of that and may, may we be in awe of who you are and in awe of your being. And out of our love for you, may we rightly serve you in, in your world. Serve one another and, and love you and love your church, your people. May, may you bless this sermon to that end as it seeks to bring out what your word declares on these matters. We love you, we bless you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so back in these verses this morning, you remember our last time together we focused purely on Paul's correlating command in verse 12, and then how the further basis for the command in verse 13 consistently supported it. As Paul begins this in stating, therefore, understandably, he's looking back on that which he just wrote. That's what the therefore is always there for. It's, it's to look back. He's making a statement. Since this is true, I'm now saying this. So in light of what our God has accomplished for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has just written in uh, the Lord Jesus emptying himself and so forth for our salvation. We are commanded to work out that salvation he has accomplished for us. And as we mentioned last time, let's note that this is not a command, beloved, to work for our salvation. Paul isn't saying, therefore, you need to work for your salvation. He is commanding us to, therefore, work it out. And in light of what the Lord Jesus has accomplished for us, in light of what he has laid down his life for us to be about, we are to work that out. Beloved, the apostle of the Lord Jesus is not now going to contradict himself in everything else he has written to, everything else he has written in his other letters, and also in this very letter where he has just said that the God who began this saving work in us will complete it himself. He who began a good work in you will complete it. He'll bring it to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He says that in chapter one, verse six. Church, the faithful God who starts this work finishes it. All right? He doesn't need our help to then come alongside him and and help him finish the work. And then he's not going to contradict himself as well, as he will say later in chapter 3, where he will speak of the righteousness of God that comes to us purely through faith in Christ, purely through trust in Christ, and not through our law-keeping or our works. For it is by grace we have been saved through faith, church. And as Paul says there in Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9, this is not our own doing. We didn't do this right along with our catechism of the month, right? The Spirit of God works faith in us. Why do we have faith? Because God worked it in us. He granted us the gift of faith. 
This is not our own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8 to 9. So, again, Paul is not saying that we are to work for our salvation, but in light of what our Lord has sufficiently attained for us in his emptying of himself on our behalf, we are commanded here to work that out. We're commanded here to be about in our lives that which he laid down his life for us to be about, uh, to be zealous for good works. Remember we mentioned last time in this Titus 2.13 and, and 14, uh, the Lord Jesus gave himself for us to, to purchase us from all lawlessness, to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purchase for himself, purify for himself a people who would be zealous for good works. We are to work that out. We are to live properly in obedience to his commands under his lordship. And then going along with the further basis for the command given in verse 13, we could as well simply say that Paul is, is also saying that we're to, we're to uh, work out what our God is working in. Right? He, he began this good work, Philippians 1, 6, in us, not outside of us. He began it in us, and we are to work out that which he is working in. Our God begins this converting work in our hearts and minds. He, he gives us renewed minds in Christ Jesus. Remember chapter 2, verse 5. Have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ. And beloved, as he continually works in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, to will meaning to desire and to work, to do, to put to action for his good pleasure, as he works that within us, we're to work that out. We're to work out what he's working in. And by his grace and for his glory, we have the responsibility as his people to work out what our God is working in, to take hold of the eternal life to which we have been effectually called. Beloved, we are not to be passive in this. We're not to be lazy in this. Uh, in this respect, we're not to just let go and let God and just pray, well, one day maybe he'll, he'll change me more. No, we are to work out what he is working in. We're to be about the work of working out our salvation, following his commands, as our gracious God equips us with everything we need to do that. And then furthermore, we also addressed how in the context with Paul using the therefore here and how everything that he's just said has to do with our seeking of unity in the church, it would also be more consistent to see this not just as him commanding us to work out our own salvation individually, but to be about that work collectively here, corporately here as his church. And beloved, each of us here are not to look uh, after our, our own interest alone, Right? We've seen that commanded over and over again through this section. We're not to look only after our own interests, but also to the interests of those around us, specifically here right in this body, specifically here, specifically here right in this church. And we are to be about that which has been supremely modeled to us in the Godhead by the Lord Jesus emptying himself, right? Uh, not grasping on to his rightful due as God, but emptying himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, leaving the glories of heaven, unhindered communion of love with the Father and the Spirit, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, to live the life of obedience to God the Father that culminated in dying the death of deaths on the cross for the salvation of his church. He laid his life down for us, Brookside, and in following him, in imaging him to one another, we are to lay down our lives for one another as well. He laid his life down for the church. We're to lay our lives down for the church. So in not looking only to our own interests, but to the interest of others, we are not to focus on just our own salvation and our own growth and our own walk with the Lord, our own growth in the truth, but we are to focus on the very same in the lives of, of those amongst us right here. Uh, we're to work out each other's salvation. We're to focus on each other's uh, salvation, each other's growth, each other's walk and growth in the truth, focused on each other's joy and progression in the faith, just as the Apostle Paul said back in chapter 1, that the focus of his life would be about upon him living and not being put to death in Rome, not just focused on me, myself, and I. You remember that goes right along with our Lord's great commission in which towards those who become disciples of his, those who become learners and followers of his, we are to teach them how to obey all that he has commanded as he is with us in that until the end of the age. Right, that's Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. The great commission of our Lord. So this is, this is what our Lord has commissioned us to. This is what we are to be about. Paul's just reiter reiterating that here. 
to work out each other's salvation, to be each other focused in truth, to be focused on making disciples and loving one another and, and teaching one another how to obey what our Lord has commanded us. And as we are about this commission, we have the great comfort that our Lord is with us and he is with us and our God is working in us, not just individually is he working in us, but he's working in us collectively, corporately, as his church to will and to work together that which he would have us be about for his good pleasure. We are his living stones, church, whom he is building together. He is doing this, as the apostle Peter states in 1 Peter 2, verse 4 and 5. We are his living stones, whom he is building together as his house, that we would together offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to him through Jesus Christ. And in seeking each other's interests, we are to be watching over one another in Christian love to see to it that that is being done to see to it that that is being done in all of our lives, that we're thinking properly, that we're worshiping properly, that we're bringing all together acceptable sacrifices to him through the Lord Jesus, that we're working out what he is working within. And as we also addressed last time, our, our ultimate motivation for this church, our ultimate motivation to be about the work that he would have for us is should be rightly from the knowledge of who our God is for us in Christ Jesus. Uh, that is another reason that the therefore is, is therefore. As Paul commends the church to obey this command much more in his absence as they would in his presence. Just as we mentioned then, it's certainly easier to continually obey and be about a certain mission when we have someone pushing us and encouraging us to continue on and endure. It's a lot easier to obey and to, to be about something when you have someone always beside you urging you on, pushing you on. And you certainly praise God that we have that for one another here. Amen. Amen. We praise God that we can strive side by side for the faith of the gospel and, and spur one another on to love and good works here. But beloved, we should be motivated even if we didn't have that. Even if I didn't have you that, uh, to, to do that for me, even if you didn't have me to do that for you, if I didn't have that in my family and it's just me all alone, uh, I, I should be motivated. Even if I'm not receiving back the love that I'm giving and the encouragement that I'm giving. Because church, our motivation should come from our Lord Christ and who he is sufficiently for us. My motivation shouldn't ultimately hinge upon who other people are being for me, but who Christ is and who he has been. For me. Brothers and sisters, if you're lacking motivation to properly serve Christ in your life and properly in his church, then honestly and lovingly you need to repent. And you need to get your eyes off of you and you need to get your eyes onto Christ. You need to get your eyes onto him. Turn your eyes upon he who emptied himself for you. Turn your eyes upon he who who, who emptied himself and left the glories of heaven, that you would be reconciled to God. Behold him. Behold him in his, in his glory. Behold him in his wonder. And you'll have all the motivation you need to properly serve him and, and lay your life down for his church just as he laid his life down for you as a part of his church. And if you don't end that, if you don't, if you don't get the motivation purely from focusing on Christ, his person and who he is, well, then honestly, you need to examine yourself to see if you're really in the faith. Because our motivation should be him and him alone. Beloved, we have enough motivation in Christ Jesus to serve him properly for a lifetime of lifetimes. We have enough motivation from Christ to ever serve him rightly forever. Right? Philippians 4.13, we'll see this later in the letter. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He, he is eternally sufficient. And thus he is sufficient to give us his grace to endure through all, thing, all things and to endure through them rightly by his grace and for his glory. And brothers and sisters, this understanding really goes right along with what we're majority-wise focusing on this morning and seeing the necessary posture of heart that we are to have in obeying this correlating command here that we have in verse 12 to work out our salvation. That's exclusively what we're looking at this morning is the necessary posture of heart that we are to have in obedience to it. The fact that the motivation for our obedience should be Christ himself, should be who our God is for us and him, that goes right along with the fact that we are called to obey this command here, to finish verse 12, with fear and trembling. 
with fear and trembling. Beloved, we are to work out our salvation individually and corporately here together as the church of Jesus Christ with fear and trembling. That is the necessary posture of heart that we are to have in obedience to this command. If we're going to properly do that, properly work out our salvation here, everything that we've just briefly discussed that we looked at last Lord's Day, then we need to do this with fear and trembling. And because that is true, certainly we need to be very clear and biblical on what that means. What does it mean to do this with fear and trembling? What does it mean to function in the fear of God? Because these two words in and of themselves, the, the word fear and trembling in our English translations, apart from them being in a certain context, they do mean, in, in the Greek, they do mean to be in, in fear. In, like in actual fear and terror. To tremble and fear. That's what they mean in, in certain contexts. And so again, we need to be clear and biblical on what this means in the context of obeying our Lord as his people, as believers in fear and trembling. Uh, because if we're not, we may perhaps read this and think that we are to obey our God with an anxious fear and just an utter terror upon us the whole time. Biblically for the believer, I don't believe that that's what this means at all. What it means at all for the child of God. So we're going to answer what it means to fear God this morning. And we're going to see how this is necessary to obey this command. Really how it's necessary to obey any command. Really how it's necessary to just serve the Lord rightly and properly to his glory in Christ Jesus. And we'll also further see how understanding this brings a lot more meaning to the basis given in verse 13 as well. And so to begin in just answering biblically what it means to fear the Lord, well, first off, from the perspective of the believer, right, the one who is commanded here to do this with fear and trembling, this does not mean that we are to obey with an anxious fear or a terror, or that we are to be constantly scared of our God in the sense that he is just eager to judge us in our sins. He's just, he's just ready to pound us to dust in our sins. I'm going to quote first uh, the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 16 to 18. 1 John 4, 16 to 18. The Apostle John says this, he says, We, speaking of Christians in the context, we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God's, God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. If you fear in this sense, you've not been perfected in love. And church, this is the same word for fear that Paul uses here in Philippians. In the context, understandably, it's being used in two different ways. John here is talking about a fear and being scared and in being fear of God's judgment. And what he's saying is that uh, if we are reconciled to God in Christ Jesus, if, if we are a true child of God, abiding in our God, abiding in his love in Christ, then there is no room in our thinking for fear of God and judgment. None whatsoever. Perfect love casts out fear. There's no room there. There's no fear in love. And so, as God's love is ever upon us, beloved, we need to understand and have it upon our minds that, that in that, God's judgment is never upon us. God's judgment, as, as a child of God, as a believer, entrusting ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, his judgment is never upon us. Just as the Apostle Paul states in Romans 8, 1, there is now no condemnation. He doesn't say, well, there's a little bit left. Well, there might be some. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No judgment for the believer. And beloved, that is because Christ Jesus our Lord took all of our judgment in our place on the cross. <laughs> All of the condemnation we deserve. He who knew no sin became sin for us on the cross. He took all the condemnation we deserve for his church on the cross. We are reconciled to God permanently because of the person and works of Christ Jesus, beloved. He has sufficiently secured our salvation to the uttermost. Brothers and sisters, in this, so secure is our position before our God that we should not fear judgment at all. 
That the Lord Jesus can say in his prayer in John 17, 23, that the Father loves us just as he loves him. That the Father loves us, his people, reconciled to him in Christ, who has taken our judgment. The Father loves us just as he loves the Son, which is a perfect eternal love that never fades. It's a perfect eternal love that never wavers. Such is the Father's love for us as it is for the Son. So, for the believer, just looking at this from the perspective of being scared of God and just looking at him as judge, you know, possibly, you know, if, if you mess up, ready to pound you to dust in your sin, that fear should never be there for the believer. It should never be there. It should not be in our thinking. If it is, it's because we're not thinking of the person and works of God in Christ Jesus correctly. We're not allowing his word to transform our hearts and minds. But we can say, however, for the unbeliever, that fear should be there. For the unbeliever, for, for the one who is not a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, has not been converted, does not have true saving faith, that fear of judgment should be there. The fear of the Lord for the unbeliever should be a fear of judgment. Because just as there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, there is condemnation for those who aren't. There is condemnation for those who are not in Christ Jesus. And... The Lord Jesus teaches himself that if you are not believing upon him, then you are, you are already condemned at this very moment. If you're not a believer upon the Lord Jesus right now, you're under his judgment right now. You're condemned right now. You're under his wrath right now. John 3, 18, whoever believes in the Son is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. You're, you're not just waiting for condemnation. You're not just waiting for that day of judgment. That will come in fullness one day. But you are condemned already right now. You're under his judgment right now. You're condemned already because you have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Very clearly, if you do not believe upon Christ and his word, you are currently under the condemnation of God right now at this very moment. The same thing is proclaimed in John 3, 36. John 3, 36, that those who do not believe and obey the Son shall not see light but the wrath of God remains on them. Literally, the wrath of God abides on them, on those who do not believe and obey the Son, John 3, 36. Beloved, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And those who haven't come to him are under the wrath and judgment of God right now as they are headed to experience it in its fullest expression upon the return of the Lord Jesus. So unless one is truly repented, unless one is truly turn, you know, change their mind. That's what that word repentance means. Unless they've truly changed their mind and they've, and they've ceased, stopped to, to trust in themselves and think they're good enough and they can be right with God and it doesn't matter how they live and so forth. And unless they have repented and truly trusted completely in the person works and word of Christ Jesus alone to follow him, then they should be afraid of the judgment to come. They should be in, in, in fear of God's judgment and him ready to pound them to dust in their sin. Because he will do so. Our, our Lord is a righteous judge. There is condemnation for them. They should be in fear and trembling in that sense in great terror. Because from that aspect of our creator church, as I've already alluded to, our, our God is not something to play with. Our God is the just judge of heaven and earth. He, he's not our, um, you know, he, he's not that, that grandpa that just lets you get away with everything. That's not who he is. Many, you know, he's the old man. He's the man upstairs. He's, so you hear all these terms concerning our God. That's not who he is. But as his word attests, it is a, and this is the same form of the word that Paul uses here, that we are to serve him in fear and trembling. Beloved, as the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 31, it is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. You know, it's, it's not a, in that sense, in his judgment, it's not a joyful thing. It's not a comfortable thing. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Psalm 711, our God is a righteous judge who cannot look upon wicked with favor. And as such, the psalmist tells us that he is angry with the wicked every day. And in Psalm 7 verse 12, he tells us, if a man will not repent, God will wet his sword as he has bent and readied his bow for judgment. He must punish the wicked, church. Our God is love, and because he is love, he hates that which is against love. He hates that which is against truth. He has wrath for rebellion, 
for sin. He is a righteous judge, and he must punish the wicked. He must punish sinners. He is ready to judge. So if that judgment, if that wrath and pure righteous anger that we deserve because of our personal sin and rebellion against our God, if it is to be taken away from us, then it must be taken away by another. He's not just going to sweep our sin under the rug. He's not just going to you know, pretend like it didn't happen. Sweep our rebellion under the rug. Oh, I just, I forgive you because you believe I exist. It must be taken away by another. Justice must be served if we are to be forgiven and justified, though we don't deserve to be justified and forgiven. And the only other who is qualified for that position, beloved, uh, from the clear teaching of Scripture, the only one who has been exclusively ordained by God for this is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. And that is the only way that we can be, become the righteousness of God. It is through Christ and it is through Christ alone. For those in Christ, we stand before God as righteous, though we are not. We are treated as righteous, though we do not deserve to be, because he was treated in our stead and how we deserve. He satisfied the wrath and justice of God in our stead, in our place, in the place of all those who, who believe and obey the Son. So, again, church, to fear the Lord as the people of God does not mean that we ought to be scared of him as the unbeliever ought to be scared of him in judgment. That's clear. But, but at the same time, we need to come back and say from that 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 does not mean that fearing the Lord as a believer means that we never think of him in his glorious judgment. That, that we never think of him in, in who he is as the glorious and wondrous and perfect righteous judge of all the earth who must do right. The righteous judge of all creation whom we are accountable to. Because church, to fear the Lord, I'm just going to give you a definition, a biblical definition I believe. To fear the Lord as a believer is to rightly behold the fullness of who God reveals himself to be. And thus from that, from beholding him and all of who he reveals himself to be, to revere him, to greatly respect him in all of the splendor and perfection of who he is. It's, it's to behold him in the fullness of who he is, and then from that to, to revere him in all of the splendor and perfection of who he is. That's what it means to fear him. Uh, I see my God and, and my creator and we're talking about all of him in his glorious attributes, in his glorious being. I see all of him, not just his love, not just his mercy, not just his justice, all of him. I don't cut him in half like a lot of the contemporary church likes to do and just talk about his love all the time. I see all of him. I behold him in church. I'm in awe of such a being as he. I'm in awe of him, and, and, and I, I revere him, and I respect him, and I want to give my life to a, to a being that is so perfect as he and who has created me in his image to worship him and to follow him. A few scriptural examples of, of seeing this shown. In Daniel 6, verse 26 to 27, Daniel 6, verse 26 to 27, King Darius, uh, he, he issues a decree right after Daniel was saved from the lion's den. And this is what he says. He says, I make a decree that all in my royal dominion, people are to tremble and to fear before the God of Daniel. Very similar words here. What Paul's saying, Philippians. you're to tremble and you're to fear before this God. And why were they to do this? Here's the reason. You're to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel for or because he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, unlike everyone else's. His dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. You see that? They were to tremble and fear before him because of the greatness of who he is. Because of the fullness of who he is. Behold him. King Darius says, and tremble before such a one as this. You need to fear this God. He is the living God. He is the one who endures to the end. His kingdom will never perish. He works signs and wonders. He delivers and rescues. This is the God we are to fear. 
As well, the Lord God declares himself, this is to his covenant people in Jeremiah 5, verse 21 to 22. In Jeremiah 5, verse 21 to 22, the Lord God declares to his people, he says, Hear this, O foolish and senseless people, who have eyes but see not, who have ears but hear not. Do you not fear me? Do you not fear me, declares the Lord? Do you not tremble before me? And this is what he says. I place the sand as the boundary for the sea, a perpetual barrier that it cannot pass. Though the waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass over it. The, the creation can't overturn what I've done. Do you see what I've done? I place the sand as the boundary for the sea. He's saying to his covenant community here, do you not know who I am? You obviously don't. Because if you did, you would fear me. You, you would tremble before the, before the glory of who I am. That's what it means to fear him, beloved, to see him, all of him, for who he is. Not a part of him, again, not a piece of him, but all of him, and to be in reverential awe. So, beloved, one cannot properly fear the true and living God until they have beheld him properly as he has clearly revealed himself to be exclusively in his word. Uh, if I only get a piece of this God, then I will not properly feel, fear him. If I only see a little bit of him, I will not properly fear him as I ought. Because then I'm not truly looking at him as I ought. For example, church, if I just view God in his love, and certainly to do that void of his justice is, is to really have an unbiblical view of love to begin with. It's just a worldly view of love. But, but if I seek to do that, as much of the contemporary church does. If I just view God in his love, we could add in this, his mercy and his grace and so forth. If I just view him in that way, then there's not going to be any reverence towards him. There's not going to be any respect or honor towards him. If I just cut God in half and I just view him in that way, with a low view of his holiness and his righteousness and justice, or just putting his justice away altogether, well then I'm back to just seeing God as that old grandpa who's always on my side and he's just going to let me get away with it. Right? I mean, he makes suggestions, but hey, at the, at the end of the day, I'm still going to be able to sit on his knee, and, and he's going to rock me, and, and everything's going to be fine. It really doesn't matter how I live. He's going to let me get away with anything, because anything goes with Grandpa. He, he's just all love, and from a worldly perspective, he's just all nice, no matter what. And then though I may seek to draw near to one, in, in that view I would never be drawing near to him in the right way because there's no reverence there to such a being. There's no reverence at all. I'll come before him and worship with just my leftovers and think that's good. I'll just bring whatever. And hey, Grandpa thinks it's okay. But then on the other hand, church, if I just view God and his justice and I just focus on him as judge, as we mentioned earlier, well, then I'm never going to want to come and joyfully embrace him rightly as he has called me to, because then to some degree, I am going to have an anxious fear of him. I'm going to have just a fear of him in his judgment. If I just cut God in half like this, having a low view of his love, a, a right understanding of his love, then I'm never going to want to draw near to him, or I'm certainly at least going to be hesitant to do so out of actually being afraid and hesitant that he's actually going to receive me as one who has sufficiently brought about everything needed for me to be received by him. So I'll be afraid that the God who has promised that nothing can separate me from his love will not approve of my coming. When he's promised that nothing will separate me from his love in Christ Jesus, but I'll pridefully, in cutting God in half in this way, think, oh, he won't accept me. Oh, no, I, I, I'm separated now. I'll be afraid that the God who has promised to be faithful and just, to cleanse his children upon their coming to him in confession of their sin, will not accept me. Though he has promised that in confession of our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Thus, beloved, viewing God like that has me actually saying no to the God who commands his people, come to me. Come to me. And I'm saying no, because I have an unbiblical view of God. I'm not fearing him as I ought. So, brothers and sisters, that's, that's also one of the many reasons why we must preach and teach the full counsel of God. We must preach and teach through God's word. We don't just jump around. but We, we start a book and we go all through it because we, we want to preach all of his word. 
Because if we are to properly fear our God as his followers, then we must view our God for all of who he is. For all of who he declares himself to be from his word. We must. Having a proper fear of the Lord is the only way we can rightly glorify him in our lives and be who we ought to be as his people. And it's the only way that we'll continue to grow and progress and join in the faith instead of falling back or being stagnant in the faith and no, no growth at all. And this is exactly why the Lord our God reveals in the Proverbs, for example, that in the fear, <clears throat> excuse me, that in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. That's Proverbs 14, verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. And in the very next verse, in verse 27, we read that the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The, in the fear of the Lord, you have strong confidence. And then in the fear of the Lord, we're a fountain of life. It's a fountain, beloved. True life continually flows out of the one who possesses a proper fear of the Lord. A strong confidence abides in this one. Confidence in God, confidence in his plan, in his ways, and that confidence grows as the fountain of life continues to flow. Well, furthermore, this is why our brother Paul elsewhere, in commanding us to cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, right, to put to death sin in our lives, he tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, that holiness will be brought to completion in the fear of God. How is holiness going to be brought to completion? In the fear of God. It is the only way, beloved, it, functioning in this manner, with this posture of heart before our God, it's the only way that we will ever truly be sanctified and conformed into the image of Christ. It's the only way we will ever be who we ought to be as the people of God. Because if I don't fear him properly, church, then I don't view him properly. And if I don't view him properly, then I'm not going to love him properly and further obey him as I ought, and thus I'm certainly not going to love his church as I ought either. This all stems from a proper fear of the Lord, seeing him rightly from his word. And so, in seeing this, it, it should be fairly simple then to see how this is the necessary posture of heart to obey what we're commanded here in Philippians 2.12. Because if I'm not obeying this command with a proper God-honoring fear and trembling of who he is, well, then I'm not going to be seeking to joyfully lay down my life for others and seek to be a means to work out their salvation instead of just selfishly trying to work out my own. If I don't fear God, I'm not going to be properly seeking to do that. If I'm not in awe, beloved, of, of the one true living God, who God reveals himself to be in his word as the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God whose glorious name is exalted above all blessing and praise. That, that, that even our own blessing and praise cannot match how great he is. This God, he who is Lord alone, who made the heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and who preserves and upholds them all while the whole earth is full of his glory. If I'm not at all of he who needs nothing added to him or taken away, as he is perfect in his being from everlasting to everlasting, the fullness of love, the fullness of justice, the fullness of all joy and pleasure, with no sin whatsoever, who could rightfully crush us in our sin, yet out of his eternal love for his people, he and the Son makes himself of no reputation, is born of a servant, born in the likeness of men, and humbles himself to live the life of righteousness we never could, and die the death that we all deserve for our sin and rebellion against him, that he would rise from the grave as Lord with all authority in heaven and earth to ever live to save all of his people who would repent and believe. Beloved, if I'm not in utter awe of, of this one, the only true and living God, well then, of course I will never be able to be properly obeying this command. Of course I will never joyfully obey this command with the proper motivation that I need to have with fear and trembling because then I'm too sinfully focused on myself instead of him. I'm, I'm focused on other things that I shouldn't be focused on instead of just functioning in his truth, thinking the way he would have me think out of a reverential fear and, and trembling and awe of this glorious creator who has created me in his image and who has recreated me in Christ Jesus and enabled me to be who he would have me be. By his grace, beloved, if that is you, if you're just too focused on you and, and not him, then you need to repent. 
If you're in Christ this morning, you need to confess your sin that he would be his promises. You need, you need to confess your sin that he would be faithful and just to cleanse you from your sin. He's promised that. Draw near to him that you would be cleansed. And saints, you, you even see how this makes the basis of the command mean much more to us than just simply stating the fact and the truth that God must sovereignly work in us that which we are to work out. Because again, we should be in awe at the mere truth that it is God, it is this God that is working in us. It, it is He, not some lesser one. He didn't appoint some lesser one to work in us. It's He, this God, who needs nothing. He who dwells in the high and holy place. That, that there's nothing that we could offer to Him that would add to Him uh, to actually benefit Him. He is working in us, this wondrous God has not only secured our utter salvation in Christ, but in that, in that, he is also working in us individually and corporately for his good pleasure. The true and living God is doing that. Uh, just think about that. What a privilege that is. What a privilege that is. Because we don't deserve that whatsoever. We all sit here deserving condemnation in and of ourselves. We all sit here deserving death. We all sit here if we're in the church, we're, we're, we're formal, former active rebels to him. And yet he, needing nothing, glorious from everlasting to everlasting, works in us. Praise works in God. us. Yeah, praise God indeed. Praise God. He works in us. In and of ourselves, nothings. He works in us. This wondrous God. What a privilege. And what motivation to properly obey this command. Church, right along with what I said before, rightly understood, this is enough motivation to serve him and his church for a lifetime of lifetimes. This is enough motivation to serve him for an eternity of eternities. That it is this God who works within us. We should be doing this with fear and trembling. It's exactly why we are to be doing this together with fear and trembling, church. Beholding our God together week in and week out from Lord's Day to Lord's Day. And this is why I said before that this biblical understanding of fearing our God goes right along with the motivation for our obedience uh, being who he is for us in Christ because they're you know, really basically the same thing. Uh, I'm seeing him rightly. I'm, I'm beholding him rightly. And in doing so, I'm serving rightly because of who he is. And church, to give you a, a great example uh, from Scripture to really see this command here obeyed, with fear and trembling. Uh, I thought a good example from this is, is found in what the Apostle Paul says elsewhere to the church in Corinth. This is, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians 7, verse 13 to 16 to you. I think, I think it's just a great example of this being obeyed with fear and trembling because he uses the same uh, terminology here and how they received and treated their brother in the Lord Titus upon his coming. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 13 to 16, Paul says, Speaking to the church in Corinth, he says, We rejoiced still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. Right? Their service to Titus refreshed him and filled the church with joy. He said, Paul says, For whatever boast I made to him about you, I was not put to shame. But just as everything we said to you was true, so also our boasting before Titus had proved true. And his affection for you is even greater as he remembers the obedience of you all. How you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice because I have complete confidence in you. You see, the church, in, in, in not having a proper understanding of what this means to be in fear and trembling, the church in Corinth didn't receive Titus with, with fear and trembling and, and serve him greatly because you know, Titus just happened to be this very scary guy and they were just on edge about what he would do. You know, just, oh my goodness, this guy, we better receive him. We better bring him in. I don't know, this guy might jump off the, well, off the handle. I don't know what he's going to do. They didn't treat him well because of that, because they were just scared. But they joyfully received him, and they refreshed him. They refreshed his heart, saints. They refreshed him, and they served him in obedience to our God in Christ because they feared him. They feared God, so they, they loved his people. They loved Titus. This brother came to them to serve them, and out of fear and trembling before the greatness of our God who works in us, man, I'm going to work for this brother. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to refresh him. I'm going to be a means for his joy and progression 
in the faith. And they properly feared their God and Savior, and thus in fear and trembling before him, they refreshed and served one of his people, one of their brothers in the Lord. And they did this, church, so much so that Paul says his boasting about them to Titus before he went there was not put to shame. I mean, I boasted about, about you before Titus, before he went, but, but now that he gets to see it. It's not put to shame. He gets to see it so much more from your works towards him. And he says that Titus's affection for them had grown even more in being there. Not only did I hear about them, did I just hear about this love, but man, in being there, actually being served by these people, man, their service, their hospitality, they're seeking to, to uh, work for my betterment, seeking my interest and not theirs alone. Man, just the, the others focused of this church just grew my affection for them. Brothers and sisters, family of God here at Brookside, such is to be the same for us here as well. Such is to be the same for us here as well. Uh, we are to be working out our salvation collectively here in unity, laying down our lives for one another in the truth, just as modeled by our Lord. And we are to do so with fear and trembling before him and, and awe and reverence of the greatness of who he is, knowing that he and his majesty is working in us, both to will and to work for his good pleasure, to the praise of his glorious grace. The, the church in Corinth, is, is not some, uh, you know, church to the side, some super church. Read 1 Corinthians. Read, read going into 2 Corinthians up to 7, in way where he says this. They were a church that had problems. Uh, they were a church that was filled with, with sinful people being conformed to the image of Christ, just as we are today. But Paul can say this about their love. Paul can say this about their refreshing one another. We are to be that by the grace of God who works in us, right? He gives us this mind in Christ Jesus to do this. And thus, as he does... As, as he knits our hearts together in love, beloved, our, our affection for one another as we serve one another ought to be growing as well, just as Titus has did for the brothers in Corinth. And church, in, in closing, as this all comes from a proper fear of God, that means, obviously, that we are to be about continually beholding him. That, that is a responsibility that we have individually as believers. Not just beholding him on the Lord's day, not just beholding him on a Wednesday evening, but continually beholding him in our life. Uh, we behold him as he has clearly revealed himself to us in his word, and we store that truth up in our hearts. Uh, we meditate on it. We, we chew on it in our minds, and we, we grab hold of his effectual promises and prayer. That as we abide in his word, whatever we ask in his name, meaning whatever we ask in accordance with his word, this he will do. Uh, we do this individually. We do this corporately together with the saints. But understandably, as there is in many cases going to be more time that we have away from one another than we are to, together or with the body. Beloved, in our everyday life, we must be actively about beholding our God that we may continually fear him properly. Actively beholding him. Brothers and sisters, if we're not daily in his word, if we're not daily thinking upon him, meditating upon him, daily in prayer, uh, and I would remind you, just as we covenant together to, to, to be about, as his church, under, under the authority of the scripture. If we're not doing that, then there is no way possible that we are fearing him as we ought as his people. We're fearing other things. We're, we're constantly thinking about other things, and not our God, and not who he would have us be, and how he would have us think in his world. We're not going to fear him properly if we're not spending time in his presence. And the only way to turn that around and cultivate that proper God-glorifying fear, if we're not, is again, as we've already said this morning, to repent, to confess, and in repentance, start doing that. Start beholding him. Start working out our salvation with fear and trembling. Brookside, may we greatly seek to cultivate the necessary posture of heart to obey this command in doing that very thing, working out our salvation individually and collectively here together with fear and trembling. And to that end, may our wondrous God, Father, Son, and Spirit, bless the preaching of his word this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our triune God, uh, the true and living God, Father, Son, and Spirit, we ask that, that, that you would stir that up within us. You have revealed it in your word, that, that, you, that you are working in us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. May you continue to do so greatly within us. May you do so vividly within us, for we desire to be holy as you are holy, individually and corporately. 
We desire to be those whom you have said in your word that you're building together, that we would bring forth acceptable offerings to you through Jesus Christ. I pray that we would be doing that in an acceptable fashion across the board. And if there's any way, Father, in which we have uh, blinders and, and we cannot see a, a way that we are bringing something in an unacceptable way, may you open up our hearts and minds to that. May you, may you continue to work in us and, and open up our minds to that. May we be quick to, uh, to confess that sin and to repent and, and to move forward together in a way that is acceptable to you. Father, we just long to be holy. We just long to function in a way that you created us to function. We long to glorify you. We long to worship you in spirit and in truth. We long to, to, to have the joy that you would have for us as your people. And, and that's properly going to be in fearing you and in serving you correctly. May you, may you continue to work that out in us. Thank you for the reform that you've given in this church. Thank you for uh, the areas of our worship and practice in which we have reformed. May you, conti may you continue to do that greatly. For your glory and for the joy of your people, may you bless the rest of our keeping of your day. May you bless our fellowship. May you bless this worship to the praise of your name and for the joy and sanctification of your people. And that we would fear you as we ought. That we may work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And we pray this in the name of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.